welcome to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. I'm your producer, Nika Larian. 30 to 40% of the food that is produced is either lost or wasted, contributing to a global food crisis with over 800 million going to bed hungry. Listen on as USAID experts speak with researchers and development professionals to explore solutions to this critical issue that demands a kitchen sink approach. When it comes to climate, food security, and food system sustainability, we have no time to waste. Thanks for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. My name is Nika Larian, Senior Food Safety Advisor and Producer of The Kitchen Sink. Today, I will be speaking with Ken Baker, Culinary Director for Rethink Food, which aims to bridge the gap between excess food and food insecure communities by preparing restaurant quality meals from food that has been rescued from going to waste. Ken, I'm really excited to speak with you today and hear your insights as a chef. Although we have yet to explore the perspective of restaurants on the Kitchen Sink podcast, it's one that interests me quite a bit because of my background. My parents owned a French bakery and cafe for 37 years in Lexington, Kentucky, and I really grew up in that bakery and that restaurant and, and really spent more time in the restaurant than I did probably in, in my own home. And growing up in that environment, I got a really great appreciation for the community building that food can provide, but also the decisions that restaurants yeah. and chefs have to make on a daily basis to really address conversations around food waste. I remember my parents having conversations about how much bread to make every single day and discussing measurements for flour because of course you want to meet demand, but you're balancing um, that desire to not have any food left over that's going to go to waste. So. Welcome, Ken. It's great to have you here today, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background. Well, thank you, Nika, for having me, and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Ken Baker. I'm the culinary director here at Rethink Food, and my background in the industry started out um, as a high school kid needing a job. You know, I wanted to partake in all the extras that high school had to offer, ring dance, uh, junior prom, senior prom, and my mom's response was, all right, you know, you got to get a job. You got to help. Uh, carry away from that. And so uh, I started my career in the hospitality industry as a busboy at, at 14, a local golf club back in Baltimore. And it really set me on a trajectory and a career path that really allowed me to have amazing opportunities to understand how the inter the interconnectivity of the hospitality world and how it creates just broader community and just great um, relationships and human interaction. I didn't have an uh, understanding of what I wanted to do in high school. And my boss was like, hey, you know, get a hospitality degree and you'll have marketable career uh, skill sets that will keep you employed for the rest of your life. And so um, from there, I would go and work in every facet of our industry. I've been in large scale catering and hotels and um, large scale um, managed dining services. It's one of the big uh, players in the space working in, on campuses like Johns Hopkins University and American University. I've worked in luxury uh, hotels for, you know, the nation's leaders um, in Washington, D.C. Um, and it all culminated to what I'm doing right here at Rethink, really um, understanding the excess that exists within our industry, because as a culinary hospitality industry, we always want to make sure we have an abundance of product to be able to meet the needs of our guests and consumers, but also as a New Yorker, intimately understanding the need of individuals who don't have a need and really just marrying those two together. That's really Rethink's strength in this space is that we marry that private sector expertise of our industry and we oriented to this community service expression that's just creating greater amplified human impact. Excellent, thank you, Ken. Yeah, I definitely relate. As soon as I probably could walk around the bakery, I had a broom in my hand and was waiting tables and really a lot of great interpersonal skills that, that can be developed in that interaction um, in restaurants. So let's, let's dive a little deeper into the work that you're doing with Rethink Food and how you're using these meals to build community while preventing waste. Absolutely. So at Rethink Food, our mission is to create a more sustainable and equitable food system. But And if you really boil that down, we really just exist and create capacity that creates broader community. Um, we utilize that currency of our mission, that meal, as its vehicle to just extend compassion to our most needy neighbors, but also utilizing it as a vehicle and resource for just upward mobility of economic development, really understanding that as 
chefs and as culinary professionals, we have a unique mantle. We have a unique positioning and community where, you know, a lot of society has become very, what side are you on on issues? You know, are you left or right, red or blue? You know, are you living in a city or a rural center? Um, we kind of focus on just disarming all that. When you sit down at the table and you break bread with somebody, you disarm all that otherness in the world and it allows us to really see what is broader community. And so we deliver our mission in celebrating culturally competent meals, making food that's for people. The unique way in which we deliver our, our, our services to our constituents is that we don't just blanket the city uh, with just meals at the lowest cost. We really are intentional about what we do and what we're providing in this space. And that level of intention is really how we measure dignity, understanding that this audience that we are uh, providing services for, it's the most vulnerable of individuals, our most needy neighbors. And we believe that food is fundamentally a human right and a no level of marginalization should dictate the quality of food you receive. And fundamentally, we believe that this population that we're servicing because of the dire straits that they're in, there should be an extra level of care to engage a sensitive audience, a le extra level of intention. And so in which we, the meals we provide are a holistically balanced, restaurant quality, nutrient dense, hot meal, not just moving food product from one place to another, just because you're hungry, you should take whatever, but really celebrating what food is. Food is that celebration of community, of culture. And so in, in delivering those nutrient dense, restaurant quality, hot meals, we also are to leaning in as much as possible to culturally celebrated meals. New York City is a mosaic of diverse individually, uh, individuals. There's um, every ethnic identity and cultural representation here in New York City. And the same way that people want to be spoken to in their preferred language and identified by their preferred name, people also want to eat meat, food that's very um, recognizable and identifiable to their cultural or ethnic identity. And to the best of our ability, we, we provide that in which we, here in our Samuel Community Kitchen, we invite the fullness of our diverse team to bring their lived experience to bear in our space. But in alternatively, when we don't have that capacity in the house, we can lean on this restaurant network of over 70 plus New York City, primarily women and minority ran restaurants that have a diverse menu mix that we can lean into all the cultural celebrations that exist here in New York City. I, yeah, I really love what you mentioned about breaking bread and celebrating culture and what unites us. And I think that's one of the, the things that I appreciate most about the effort to reduce food waste is that, that I hope that it's a, a pretty bipartisan issue that everyone can get behind. I don't think there's anyone out there that, that thinks that we should be wasting food or that it's a good thing to be wasting food. So I, I, I really like this movement because I think it's something that, that everyone can can latch onto and get behind. And I think a lot of that is just finding the right conversations and the right ar arguments to make to, to different people for them to see the all the different benefits that can come from reducing food waste. So you mentioned this, this community building, this um, alleviating of, of food insecurity. Of course, there are climate and economic benefits as well. Um, so many different arguments to, to be made. Um, so I, I really wanna, to, again, take it a little deeper um, about how the process of Rethink Food is actually happening. So can you tell me how you're sourcing this excess food? How are the meals prepared? And who has access to the meals? Absolutely. And so how we really source all of our um, amazing abundant donations are the catalysts of our meal making. It's really just leaning into our built-in secret sauce, the muscle memory that we're able to tap into by being hospitality and culinary professionals. I always say, you know, we aren't nonprofit people trying to feed people. We're a bunch of food people who just happen to run a nonprofit. And so we know within our industry where the access exists. I can walk into any kitchen, any uh, in any operation, no matter the scale or size, and see where access exists. Because for most of our for-profit partners, you're delivering a very standardized, unique menu offering. And you don't have 100% utilization or yield of all of your ingredients that you're using to deliver your menu, we can utilize that excess in creating meals and the unique way in which we're, again, we're creating meals. We're not just making one thing and blanketing across the city. We're making a myriad of various different menu applications. And the Rethink meal is comprised of a protein element, a carbohydrate element, and a vegetable element. And so all this disparate ingredients from our retail partners like Whole Foods and Trader Joe's or corporate cafeterias or just independent restaurants, we can comprise all of that here in our sustainable community kitchen. And then we develop menus that reflect not only um, 
the nutrient dense restaurant quality caloric intake that we have to comprise that meal but also those culturally celebrated meals that re reflect the unique communities that we're feeding you know how we feed the bowery uniquely different than how we feed washington heights leaning into our unique way in which we deliver our services is that we don't deliver any of our services like i said in our intro rethink exists to provide provide capacity to create broader community and we partner with community-based organizations these are institutions like rec centers, faith-based institutions, libraries, these institutions that have the anchoring and credibility already in the community, these are their neighbors, so they have an accountability to the constituent that we're servicing. And we just go there and ask them, how can we help? How many meals do you need? What are the dietary preferences or versions of your community? How is best way to serve or portion the meals for them? Because everyone eats differently. Um, and so amassing this, this donor network that allows us to go out and then we capture all of this excess. Everyone wants to give and be sustainable, but it's about making it work, the brass tacks of the logistics of it. And again, we try to not only deliver meals that provide a greater amplified human impact, but alleviate all the barriers of access, including on our donor side. And so we own every single touch point of this operational chain. We go out and we capture the donations. We transport the donations. They come back here to our community kitchen. We curate and produce the meals. We package the meals. We label the meals. And then we deliver the meals back out to our community because that's the stewardship of care in which we have to convey to our constituents because we have to combat these entrenched stigmas of dumpster diving or is the food suitable for human consumption or how are they transporting that? Um, we own every single facet of that operational uh, chain that produces a meal so that we can say confidently to our constituent that we are the codified credential professionals that can uniquely rethink food and we're delivering you a well-balanced, holistic, um, restaurant quality, nutrient-dense meal. Well, I, I have to applaud you, Ken, on, on several different fronts. Um, one, I mean, like you said, alleviating the barriers of excess and and all the coordination of logistics that that has to happen to to make this work but really on a deeper level i just i want to appreciate the the artistry that goes into cooking and the skill that it takes to not only collect all these different excess ingredients but then transform it as you said into a nutrient dense and culturally relevant meal on a larger scale i think sometimes we even struggle to do that in our own kitchens and i think a lot of that is is I hope that there's a narrative shift around a lot of different things, including around cooking, where cooking, I enjoy cooking. I think it can be a fun challenge. It's a great opportunity to be creative and say, okay, I have all these different ingredients. What can I make out of this that's unique, that I'm gonna like, that maybe has a little something new that I haven't tried before. And, and I think sometimes that's a barrier for people that it seems like an obstacle and it's a burden. And, and so I think there's a lot of work that we need to do around narrative shifting um, when it comes to food waste. We often, as I said, make the economic case for reducing food loss and waste on this podcast. It's one that we've heard many times, but I think what we've heard less of is making the human case for preventing food waste? How do we get people to care about food waste and get excited about the opportunities to rethink our relationship with food? I love this question, Nika, and I, and I love the term you use, narrative shift. That's really what we're doing. We're redefining, re, we're rethinking food, but we're also redefining all the components and aspects of all of that. Redefining what it is to be a nonprofit operating in this food excess uh, space, what it is to Define sustainability. You know, we've taken a nuanced approach to defining sustainability. And of course, in what we're doing and collecting excess and curating it into meals, you know, 40% of food that's produced in this country doesn't touch a human lips. The number one contributor to landfills is food waste. It's a big, uh, it a lot, provides a lot of methane that is adding to our climate crisis. And so when we're talking about sustainability, and if you look at our logo, I love our logo because it, it showcases the whole operational model of what we do at Here Everything Food, but the beginning of that R and the end of that R, it starts and stops with people. We keep people centered in everything that we're doing, all that we're doing in um, advancing sustainable cooking initiatives and providing meals that are fighting food insecurity. All that we're doing is just holistically sustaining our communities, then that's what we, we want to keep that, that individual centered in that, the individual that's receiving our meals, the individuals that are part of our donor network, individuals that are part of making our meals here in the footprint of our sustainable community kitchen, you know, and defining um, 
redefining the sustainability, that narrative shift about holistic sustainability, we look at ourselves to be a blueprint and model for our industry. And so for that narrative shift about sustainability, yes, we want to focus on um, collecting excess and utilizing it and saying the longevity of this viable um, food that's suitable for human consumption because there are one in seven New Yorkers that are food insecure and we want to exist to provide them meals. But we also want to talk about sustaining our community, sustaining our industry. What we also are doing is just a great business practice. Um, when we look at the inflationary economy that we exist in right now and that number one fixed cost, if it's labor or food, you know, depending on your operation, those are your one and two fixed costs. Well, that food is perishable. So finding ways to be more sustainable and extending the longevity of that allows you greater yield and utilization within your operational model, and it's giving you a higher ROI. Um, but I also believe in just when you take care of your people, your people take care of you. And so as an industry, being more sustainable and centering the individual, sustaining our communities, sustaining our service core. Because here's the untold truth about our industry. A lot of the individuals that do the behind the scene works of the hospitality and culinary industry that's underpinned of service core professionals, they exist in the same communities that we're servicing. And so it's like a chicken or egg situation. They're, they're, they're powering this amazing engine of um, hospitality and culinary arts, number one industry in the world, but also existing in underserved communities where one in seven New Yorkers or depending on that area that are food insecure. And it doesn't make sense. And so in holistically centering them and their needs, presenting Rethink as a model of a marquee hospitality employer that allows for um, greater engagement in your community, greater planning. You know, we have our starting wage is twenty three dollars and seventy six cents because that is what a living wage is in New York City. And still, with that, I challenge anybody to find and live off of that alone. Um, in sustaining our communities, being able to provide these meals free of cost, and then one of the questions you had for was, you know, barriers of access. We don't ask any questions. We come from the assumption that we are chefs. We have the ability to make meals. If people need a meal, we're going to provide a meal. We're not going to ask questions. You don't have to demonstrate your need for it because that also that's not dignified you know we want to fight those entrenched stigmas when you're talking about food insecurity we're also just talking about a symptom of poverty and in this country we have a lot of shame and stigmas around not having of resources which is what poverty is we want to exist and the meal to be that currency that's giving you some alleviation of the present state of mind and hey at least for this one day or for this circumstance, I don't have to worry about where my next meal is going to come from. I know I, ha I can go to St. John's Bread and Life every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and have that nutrient-dense, restaurant-quality, hot meal. Because also take into a fact that time is a big factor. Whether you have resources or not, you can't get more of. And if you're a single mom working overtime just to keep rent, um, keep a roof over your head, paying rent in this affordability crisis that we've experienced in New York City, and you have multiple kids in which you also are uh, juggling child care, by the time you get off of work, corral your kids, you may not have the time to make a meal, or you may be because you're so under-resourced or by the combating the affordability crisis of the housing situation here in New York City, you may not be domiciled in a place that has full infrastructure to make a meal. And so just alleviating all the barriers of access, giving you a safe and secure place to go that's fixed in your community, like your local rec center or faith-based institution and sitting down in a safe environment, having a hot quality, nutrient-dense meal that you're happy to give to your kids. You feel security of your kids and it's, it's real food for real people that's very uh, very akin to home cooking. And, and so that's that's the narrative shift that you know we're, we're de-institutionalizing the food. We're making it accessible. We're not asking the question like demonstrate your poverty. And in, sustainable, in doing all of that, yes, we are having amazing impact on combating our climate crisis, but more intimately, we're sustaining our communities, creating broader community, allowing individuals to look at themselves in the mirror, identify what privilege you have. And it's not just financial resources, it could be relationships, it could be just time. Do you have time to go and come volunteer with us for two, three hours and help us make meals that allows us to amplify our footprint in certain communities? Um, relationships. Do you have time to introduce us to people like Nika and USAID who can expand the footprint of our mission and let people know what we're doing? Those, that's all privilege and utilizing that privilege to uplift others. That's how we define equity when we talk about that equitable, sustainable food system that we're trying to create here at Rethink Food. Absolutely. I think a lot of us, uh, 
take for granted the the access that we have to nutritious food. And I, I think it's a good thing that there was a recent report to the UN Food Waste Index that got a lot of press attention when it shared that households are wasting 1 billion meals a day. At the same time, almost 800 million people are going to bed hungry every single night. And that dichotomy is just, it's, I mean, it's devastating. It's, it's, it's so problematic. And I think it got the attention that it deserved. And I hope that we can use it as a jumping point to really get the momentum going. And as you mentioned, I think the time is right because of the affordability crisis. A lot of us who, you know, maybe again, like we're taking for granted the access that we have to nutritious food, we're feeling it now when we go to the grocery store. And I think it's a good time to 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 capitalize on on that moment to say, hey, it makes economic sense for you to to not throw away this food that you're spending your hard earned money on. And at the same time, there's this human case that there's so many people going to bed hungry and we're wasting so much food every single day. And while I think there's been a lot of focus on making the economic case because it works for companies, it works for the private sector, they care about the bottom line. And to a certain extent, I think households do too. But we've talked on previous episodes of the podcast about the plastic straw argument that this was a, you know, what is the argument that's going to get people to care about? Well, what about the turtles? I can't use a plastic straw. Like I'm thinking about the ocean. Like we need that moment of what is really going to get people to think every single time that they take their plate to the trash can and they're about to dump all of this food into the trash. What is going to be that, that story that sticks with them? And to me, I think it's in households, it's not the economic case. I think it's it's the human approach. And it's thinking about the people that are that need that food and that are going to bed hungry every night. And so I really appreciate the work that you're doing, that Rethink Food is doing to rethink the problem. The food waste issue is a big problem. And we need people that are changing the narrative, that are rethinking how we approach the issue and rethinking how we approach food. So it's been a really great conversation with you today, Ken. I've really appreciated your insights. Um, and I hope that we can use these insights to continue to make food a community building aspect. And again, to bridge this, this gap that we have between the food that we're wasting and the people who really need it. Well, thank you so much, Nika, for having me. And then thank you to your audience for uh, learning more about Rethink Food. If you want to learn more about Rethink Food, please visit our website at www.rethinkfood.org. Um, and we're simply at Rethink Food on X and Instagram as well, if you want to follow us and see what we're doing. And if you're ever here in New York City, stop by our sustainable community kitchen and help us make some meals. Help us just create part of community here in New York City. Absolutely. Well, I'll be there in October, so I may have to take you up on that offer. We'd love to have you. Love to have you. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Thank you so much, Nika. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink. This podcast was produced by Nika Larian and is organized by the USAID Food Loss and Waste Community of Practice co-chairs, Ahmed Kablan and Anne Vaughn. Additional thanks goes to Feed the Future, the U.S. government's global food security initiative, and the USAID Center for Nutrition. Ooh.